Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the September Benefits Planning Community of Practice call. We are very lucky today to have Susie Paulson from Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation Services presenting to us on impairment-related work expenses. I am recording this webinar and we'll post it to the Benefits Planning site afterwards. So um, if you miss anything or know of others who weren't able to attend, you can hear them that way. Susie, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and get started. Thank you for reminding me to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome everybody. I'm excited to be back working for the state of Iowa. And uh, today we're gonna talk about impairment related work expenses. And it's gonna be a little deeper dive than um, what I've ever done, uh, except for in my initial training. So hopefully it will still meet the needs that you have. Um, so the use of an IRWI can be applied to job candidates on either SSDI or SSI. The impact for each of these is going to be different, but ultimately to the advantage of the job candidates. Uh, with SSDI, it can lower the amount of earnings that are counted, and it can bring the job candidate's income below SGA. With SSI, it will increase the monthly SSI cash benefit. It's almost always to their advantage uh, when the individual is on SSI. So let's talk about what is an IRWI, impairment related work expense. For an IRWI to be claimed, the device, services, etc., must be necessary for the person to work. It has to be related to the disabling condition. Um, the beneficiary needs to be paying for that service or item each month in the month that they're working and or in anticipation of working it can be something that is reimbursed it can't be something that is reimbursed in cash or check or any form of money like a gift card anything like that it's something that that does not get reimbursed by anyone else uh, payment in kind is also not acceptable um, the cost must be re reasonable so ultimately, Social Security decides if the IRWI is going to be acceptable to them. Social Security will look at the disability determinations um, this, that establish medical basis for disability. They're going to make sure that um, they also look at any secondary disabilities the person might have to determine if this IRWI that they're claiming is appropriate. They'll also look at whether the person is currently being treated for the condition. If the IRWI seems unrelated, then Social Security will come back and ask the beneficiary to provide additional medical records um, that adds validity to the appropriateness of the IRWI. So it's very important that even if, um, if it's a secondary thing, to make sure that they give all the evidence that, that the individual has to Social Security. So the other thing is when they verify the payment, uh, was the payment for the IRWI made in the month that the person was working? There's a few exceptions to this, like certain durable goods that might have been purchased prior to the start of working, like say a van modification. Um, remember that for SSI, it must be counted in the month that it's purchased and that, and that the income is received. So Social Security will also verify that the cost is reasonable and that the cost was paid by the person with the disability and not reimbursed. Again, that's uh, very important. Um, I've also attached this form um, statement of claimant or other person, and this is a way that they can report uh, an IRWI to Social Security. So what's reasonable? <clears throat> That's a really good question. <laughs> Social Security is going to determine if the cost is reasonable, if it's the prevailing charge for a similar item or a service. Um, if, the, if Social Security determines that the cost is outside the range of what's the prevailing charges, um, they can use the standard or the normal cost that's gathered, um, but always know that you can appeal any decision that they make. Services and items. Services are deductible if they're received while the person is working. If the person has to leave work temporarily to receive the services, they can still count it as a deductible. Um, the cost of services that are received before the person begins working are not deductible. 
items needed to work are deductible whether the item was purchased before or after the person began working if the item is needed in order for them to work and and this is um, something that at times I think the Social Security office might go a little too far um, I was working with an individual who requires a lot of personal care assistance in order to work um, and they had not done a review on her for 12 years which was kind of a long time, I thought. Anyway, they uh, said that the services that she got over the weekend, she was on a respirator, um, she has people coming into her home. Um, they were going to disqualify that because they said that she wasn't working um, on the weekends. So why should that be considered an Irway? And But the answer is if she didn't have that service during the weekend, she wouldn't survive the weekend. So sometimes you have to look at things like that um, and, and you have to make the argument to Social Security. So uh, for recurring monthly services, for instance, like a therapy, medical services, attendant care, um, the total amount paid by the beneficiary, including sales tax, would be the deductible amount. As long as the cost is reasonable, again, that reasonable comes into play. Um, such costs are deductible only if the services are received while the person's working. Um, here again, if they need it to, in order to be able to work, we need to make that. So I also put that explanation in again, in the case of a durable equipment like a respirator, a wheelchair, or similar items, the recurring cost is paid sometimes over a period of time under some type of an installment purchase plan. All the costs involved, including interest and sales tax, are deductible. And, you know, I've... I didn't know that. I didn't realize that the interest that they would be paying would also be considered deductible. So um, non-monthly reoccurring expenses refers to those expenses that are deducted over a period of time that is less frequent than that monthly. So that would be something like um, that was paid quarterly or yearly. Um, these expenses can be deducted entirely in the month that the payment is made or the individual can, can choose to allocate over the months for the period payment. Um, usually the person can decide which method um, gives them the greatest ad advantage. Uh, this would also be true of down payments. Social Security can provide the calculations for how this would work and whenever the development of an early applies, it's a best practice to communicate with Social Security for guidance. And, and this is very true for an early because Social Security is not going to let you know whether or not they've approved it. Um, sometimes when you pull a benefits query, BPQY, you'll notice that those deductions are listed on there. Um, but they're not going to send you a letter when you send all this evidence, the person reports every month. You know, unless they call Social Security to, to verify that that's what's happening, they, they're not going to know. There's no letter that they're going to send out to you. So uh, some specific expenses. I wanted to go into some actual examples of things that, that normally we would see with an early, or maybe there's things that you haven't thought of. Um, that would be like routine drugs or medical services, some transportation, uh, specially arranged transportation, attendant care, home modifications, and service animals. So the thing to remember about an Irwi is it's, um, I have this three point thing that I always, when I ask somebody, um, is this something that you're paying for out of your own pocket? Um, no one's reimbursing you. You need it in order to work and it's related to your disability. Those are the three things you wanna look at. So we're gonna talk about the routine drug and medical first. So routine um, refers to regularly prescribed medical treatment or therapy. Again, the person's paying for it out of their own pocket. It's not something that, you know, a lot of things are covered by Medicaid. Um, the IRWI allowed must eliminate or reduce the progression of the disease. So a good example might be uh, radiation treatment or chemo, corrective surgeries or antidepressants. Um, now, most of those are going to be covered 
by your medical service, your medical health insurance, either your Medicare or your Medicaid. But some things that may not be covered would be like chiropractic. Uh, I was able to use that for an individual who had a lot of uh, back issues. He was able to work, but the chiropractic is what made it so that he was able to work. So we had to make that argument and he had to pay for that out of his own pocket. So drugs and medical services that do not increase functioning would not be deductible. And might, those might include regular physicals, uh, things like allergy treatments, dental or vision, as long as these aren't related to the actual impairment. Uh, the cost of health or life insurance premiums cannot be counted as an IRWI. And boy, I get that question almost daily. So the next thing is transportation. And, and this is the one that most of us think about, a modified vehicle. If the disability requires modification to a vehicle in order to drive to work, that modification must be critical to the operation of the vehicle and directly related to the individual's impairment. Only the actual cost of the modification can be deducted as the early, not the vehicle. Um, any maintenance or repair of the modification can also be deducted, but not the cost to repair the actual vehicle. The other thing that most of us are familiar with is all the mileage to and from work is also deductible. So SSA is going to use the IRS standard mileage rate of it this year it, for 2019, it's 58 cents a mile. Um, they're going to determine the daily mileage and the cost. Now, I would always recommend that you send in um, like a map quest of, of the directions to get to the place. You know, that kind of makes it easier for them. Um, so a good example of this one would be an individual that I worked with who uses a wheelchair. He worked at Walmart three days a week as a cashier, really loved the job. Um, and, you know, he kind of thought about working another day, but he wasn't sure if his body could handle it. Um, he was right, right under SGA. He was a SSDI beneficiary. And so we were able to get, um, you know, them to start using that Irwi um, for his mileage because he drove an adapted vehicle. Um, he had hand controls. Um, unfortunately, he tried four days a week, but it wasn't, it, he had too many problems. He needed more rest periods. So really, that was way too much for him to be able to work. Um, I think if he would have been able to get like a standing wheelchair, it might have been uh, more of a possibility for him to work more days. So an unmodified vehicle. I uh, thought this was really interesting. If the beneficiary's impairment prevents the use of the available public transportation and driving an unmodified vehicle is necessary, um, then the mileage is allowable. A physician or a VR counselor or other medical provider must verify that the person, the person is unable to um, use available public transportation. So I think this can be a little like, uh, difficult to understand, but an example is a person uses a wheelchair and public transportation is not equipped for wheelchair use. That makes sense. Person cannot manage getting on or off public transportation. Um, for example, maybe their impairment prohibits travel from home to the bus stop. Maybe it's like, you know, a mile that they would have to travel. Uh, another example, person uses a service animal that's not per permitted on a public transportation, um, or the person is not mobility trained in the use of public transportation. The nature of the impairment precludes the travel on public transportation. For example, an individual with a respiratory illness, they would require special air-treated environments. It would be um, bad for their health if they were in a public environment. Um, the person cannot negotiate public transportation. Um, they're not able to adjust it. Maybe they don't have paratransit. Um, but so, you know, they would probably be allowed to use alternative transportation. There's a lot more examples that I found when I was doing research on this. And that's the important thing to remember is that um, when you're looking at different impairment-related work expenses, 
you know, there's just a lot of different situations. Um, just remember those three things. Uh, it's something that the individual needs in order to work. It's related to their disability and they're paying for it out of their own pocket. And asking, you know, investigating that when you're talking to somebody is really going to be important, especially uh, with SSI, it's always going to put more money into their pocket. So I didn't go into any more examples of transportation, but believe me, there are a ton of different things related to transportation um, that you might want to consider reading. So attendant care. Assistant, this is assistance that enables an individual to prepare for work. That would include like bathing, toileting, dressing, um, maybe cooking, eating, communicating, traveling to and from work, and similar personal needs. Um, I was working with an individual recently that uh, because of the disability, he's not able to use his hands. So someone has to drive him to work. Someone also has to, and he got a really great job, but they also have to come in at lunchtime um, to set up his food for him to be able to eat. Um, so, you know, those kinds of situations, you know, that's attendant care and it's on the job, that would be considered impairment related work expense. Attendant care services can include services provided that would help the person in performing the functions of their job, uh, such as a reader or a, a job coach. But remember, a lot of times a job coach is paid for out of a waiver. It has to be something that they're paying for themselves. So uh, if you think about it, sometimes they get to a certain point with job coaching, they're making too much money. Um, maybe they should pay for it out of their own pocket in order to increase their income. So the definition is applicable only to those services which can be shown to be needed for work. The attendant care can be a uh, service needed in a work setting or in traveling to or from work. Um, all of the costs must be paid for the, by the person and reimbursed and not reimbursed by any other means. So I know I keep repeating that, but I think it's really important to remind ourselves of that. Of that. So the next thing is home modification, and this one gets really tricky too. So. Um, you might want to take a few notes on this. <laughs> so employment outside of the home that assists the individual uh, in leaving the home, like exterior ramps, railings, path, pathways, anything that helps them be able to actually leave the home. Modifications that are done to the interior of the home are primarily uh, intended to allow them to function within the home and they're not necessarily deductible as an IRWI. Um, if the individual is employed at home, Let's say they work from home, their job is at home. So modification that creates the working space to accommodate a person's impairment, those are deductible to the extent that they're specifically designed to help the individual be able to work from home, okay? Um, that would be considered an IRWI. There's some other rules that might allow IRWI uh, when a company allows telework for an employee that requires uh, home-based accommodation, these costs are, you know, then deducted as an IRWI. And, and this would exclude any temporary or optional telework. So if they're temporarily allowed, then, you know, that's, that's gonna be different and probably not allowed. Okay, so service animals. This one I think is really interesting too. In fact, I suggested to a few of my uh, coworkers that maybe they needed an animal um, at work. <laughs> it would be nice, wouldn't it? The animal has to assist the individual in overcoming functional limitations in order to work. So that makes sense. This would include all the expenses related to owning the animal, like the purchase of the animal, the training, um, the food, licenses, veterinary items, and, and any other services that the animal would need. Um, and of course, you know, a doctor is also supposed to make that statement that the individual needs the animal in order to be able to work. So I want to stop for a second there. If there's any questions, I'll, 
um, either try to answer them or maybe I can do some more research and follow up with you. Does anybody have any questions right now? Okay, good. I hope that means that I haven't put you to sleep. <laughs> Okay, so um, we're going to talk about SSDI documentation of IRWI. Um, <clears throat> so IRWIs uh, should be identified and described on the initial 821. That's that work activity report. It's an 820 if it's a self-employment. Um, so they, they're going to have to complete that anywhere. And this is where uh, Social Security is going to capture that information. It asks specific questions. Um, for the person to be able to fill that out. It doesn't mean that, that they can't come back later and say, hey, I know now that this is an impairment-related work expense, but this is kind of that they're trying to capture that information. Normally, an impairment or a work activity report is going to be filled out sometime during their trial work period or even just a little bit after that. I really, that's one of the things I really look for um, when I'm talking to somebody is, uh, you know, have they gotten that work activity report? Because if I'm looking at their income and I'm seeing that there's all this income, but they're not saying that they've used any trial work, uh, I'm going to want a work activity report to be done um, by Social Security so that we know whether or not they've used all of their trial work or where they're at in that whole process. It's really important. So, um, the 821 needs to be completed after they've reported to Social Security that they're working. So while the IRWIs can't reduce the countable income during the trial work period, that's very important, I get that question a lot too, um, the beneficiary should still document the IRWIs in the Social Security 821 um, and retain any documentation of the expenses that they have. Social Security will evaluate the IRWI during that SGA determination, which is going to happen after the trial work period. Um, allowable expenses will be deducted from gross wages to determine countable earned income. IRWIs are deductible after any subsidies, so any special conditions that were evaluated and applied, then after that would be when you would subtract the IRWI. Early determinations are subject to the appeals process, so you can always appeal it. And I, and I think that we can't say that enough to people. Um, even when they're in the application process, people will just quit. They'll, they'll, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't get through this time. I'm not gonna. I met with a young woman on Friday, and it was just tragic. She's early 20s, trying to go to school, has daily migraines, is. Um, barely able to function, could not, has not been able to get a really clear diagnosis until just recently. And they've sent in so much medical records, but she's still gotten denied. And I, and I feel like she's finally found a doctor that understands what's happening to her and why she has these migraines. Um, and she needs to reapply. So I think, you know, cause she was like, well, they denied me. I don't have any recourse. And I thought, yeah, you always, you can always ask for reconsideration. You can always appeal any decision. And that also applies with IRWIs. So with SSI documentation of an IRWI, and you'll see I've got two different forms here and I also sent them to Paige um, so that you could use these. This impairment related work expense request, this is something that I think I got from VCU. The other one, of course, is a social security form. So since IRWIs affect the SSI payment differently, okay, than SSDI, we need to talk about that. With SSI, an IRWI is almost always going to be good for the individual. It's going to put more money into their pocket. And I didn't go into the calculation of that in this training, um, but if the person spends, let's say, $150 a month on their IRWI, and they have all the documentation related to it, they paid for it out of their own pocket, it's related to their disability, they get about half the value of that um, back in their um, SSI check, so about $75. It isn't 100%, it's not like a, a blind work ex expense, but it, it does put more money back into their pocket. 
And with SSI, that's really huge, valuable. So this uh, notice of change in earnings status form, or you can send a letter that requests review of potential IRWIs. Um, it's very important that individuals keep all, all documentation of the URWI on a monthly basis and be prepared to submit that documentation whenever Social Security reviews. Um, Social Security may choose to average the monthly IRWI cost. Uh, you know how when you're, you know how much you're making, say you're, you're working and you're making $400 a week. Um, Social Security is just going to kind of average it out because we don't know. I mean, every, every week it's going to be a little bit different. Every month it's going to be a little bit different. So we like Social Security to do that estimated the way that they do um, because, and we can ask them to lower or raise that a little bit if we need to. That keeps, it's better if the person is, if they're estimating it a little bit high because for me, I'd rather have them owe me than me owe them. It's just kind of a thing for me, but um, yeah, so the individual can request that. And so the good thing is too that then Social Security will also um, estimate that early. Uh, cost and you can always ask for them to do that for sure and then once they get verification of the actual wages then they'll be able to adjust it so an early and the use of pass uh, I think this is pretty interesting and had never thought about it in this way before, but an IRWI, IRWI would not be deductible when the purchase of the IRWI is part of the pass expenses during that same month. If it's not part of the pass, then it could be deducted. Let's say the individual doesn't have a lot of money in the pass, but they have a, a, an ex impairment related work expense of say $400 um, and they currently have $300 in their pass account, they could use the 300 out of the pass account and then that extra 100 that they have to pay for out of their own pocket, that could be considered the IRWI. Next, we look at an IRWI in self-employment. So if the IRWI also meets the IRS definition of an allowable business expense, then it can't be claimed as an IRWI for social security purposes. It actually is, in most cases, more advantageous for them to use it as a business expense, um, but not always, I mean, but most of the time. If it's not a, an allowable cost, like a routine drugs or medical services, then it wouldn't be allowed as a business expense, but it would be considered an IRWI. So I got through this really fast, I know. I wanted to give you the palms. Um, the SSDI Irway and the SSI Irway. Do you have any questions? Feel free to unmute your line if you have questions or you can type it in the chat box. So Paige, do you think they're still breathing? I think so. Okay, I got a couple of thank yous. I hope that helps a little bit. I gotta tell you, they're, Irwin's just are, we don't do a good job of identifying them. I, I'm having trouble reading, uh, Paige, can you? Sure. There's Here, let me, says, let me bring it uh, up there. Um, it's asking about dogs and miniature horses as service animals. Oh, wow. Um, that would be interesting to see a horse in a building um, that isn't a barn. <laughs> I don't know. I, I have no idea. I, did you read that somewhere? Or? Well, the ADA definition of service animal includes those two. Oh, okay. That could be. Yeah. So the question might be, would an emotional support animal count as an early? Yeah. I mean, if they need it in order to work, 
yeah, from everything I've read, it sounds like it would be. Any other questions? Like I can't see anybody's face, but I can, I know you guys are there. I can see your names. <laughs> All right, no questions. Any anything? Nope. So we're all set. Thank you so much, Susan. All right. Yeah. Thank and you. you're gonna you've recorded this and you've got my PowerPoint.